Good day, Clark. Thanks again for agreeing to do this video with me. For our audience, could you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about where you live and work and what you do, and perhaps dive into some of the more interesting things you've worked on through the course of your career? Sure, Guy, and thanks for the opportunity. So, I'm Clark Quinn. Uh, I'm the proprietor of Quinnovation, which is me, boutique consultancy. I live in Walnut Creek, California, and uh, I, for the past 20 years I've been assisting organizations to take what we know about how we think, work, and learn and apply that to the design of learning systems. It's, that's not where I started. Mm -hmm. um, I saw the connection between computers and learning as an undergraduate, and I said, wow, this is really cool, and I found a way to make that happen. There, in my university, there wasn't a program in it back then. Um, and uh, we, had the, we called it computer-based education, but we had a program where you could design your own major. And so I did. And I uh, worked with a couple of folks and uh, got it. My first job at a college was designing and programming educational computer games. So, um, and uh, we didn't necessarily know enough about how to do that. So we did a, a few games that were, you know, quite popular. I did this through my, the company I was working for. Um, and, uh, but I realized, you know, when I was trying to go, oh, should we use spacebar and return to navigate through the menus or number items? And this is for kids, but I, we didn't know. Mm -hmm. And then I read an article calling for cognitive engineering. What, you know, taking what we know about how our brains work and applying that to the design of systems. And I wrote the author of that article. I said, where could I study this? And he said, well, with me. And so I went down and interviewed with him, and um, that was Don Norman, and I did my, ended up doing my PhD thesis with him, and uh, did the postdoc, uh, and then uh, went and taught in the academic world for a few years. Interestingly, I made a game out of my postdoc, out of my doctoral thesis, mm -hmm. and, um, and then when I was at the University of New South Wales where I was teaching, a colleague came and said, oh, could you make a, a game? You know, these, these people need a game. Who are they? They're Association for Children's Welfare Agencies. This was an Australian organization. And kids who grew up without parents, um, at age 18, basically, they're kicked out on the streets, and they get this idiosyncratic training to prepare them and there was a big concern and they'd gotten a funding and they created a met, uh, comic book and a video and a poster and then they realized what these kids did is come into the care centers you know where they come when they're in foster care or orphanages whatever and they play the computer games on the computers there they said well we need a computer game so they'd spent all their money and they said could you develop a game i actually had a talented student who wanted to do a meaningful project and so we developed a game and we tested it with them and they loved it but they said the graphics aren't good so they went away and I went with them and we got some funding and we tuned up the graphics and they ended up releasing it. And this was still one of the most rewarding projects I've ever done on it. It was a game, it, you know, kids wandered around a little, you know, a country town and a you know, city town and they'd take the bus back and forth and they had to figure out how to survive but it was a safe place to do it. Um, interestingly, so while I was there, I you would occasionally, you know, get requested to do things like book reviews. And I got a book on electronic performance support systems. Now, it wasn't Gloria Geary's okay. famous one. It was somebody else who'd written one, and I reviewed it. But I got intrigued by the idea, and it very much resonated with the principles we talked about. So when I was a grad student, Don was very much about designing systems for the way people think. I just kind of wanted to do twist on design for how people learn. So that was my sort of focus. But they were very much about designing systems. And I realized afterwards that electronic support systems that Gloria Giroux was doing, they were making up for bad interface design. And interface, you know, at the same time I was part of the HCI community, I taught human computer interface. They kind of said any student at Dawn should be able to teach computer mm -hmm. interface design. And I actually tried to do research in that and realized my heart was still in educational technology, so that's what I largely focused on. But I was paying attention and all the interface designers were going, what trauma phone support systems? That's just bad, you know, making for bad interface design. We should do better interface design, which is not a bad idea. <laughs> but that's not what happened. So um, I did a project, I had a student build a, 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 
uh, performance support system for interface design, sort of numbed mm -hmm. up my interests as I have a bad habit of doing and in getting into student study. I was in school of computer science, so I could they didn't do the programming, I did the design. We had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Got publishable papers and all that good stuff. Um, but uh, then we ported it, you know, to the web. And eventually that game, by the way, we ported it to the web and you can still play it. Hmm. It's still playable on the web because it was the first CGI's, but CGI still runs somehow. Anyways, um, came back to the U.S. Uh, birth of our son triggered a homing instinct, and mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to come back to the U.S. and California, and ended up getting a job with the guy who'd hired me out of college to design the program, the games. He was now working for a, essentially a startup, but it was part of a big initiative. There's a long story there I'm not going to go into. You know, it's best done over a beer, <laughs> but uh, sorted. Um, but and my project was to lead the development of an adaptive learning system, and so there we were going to, you know, uh, find out who learners were. We weren't doing it on learning styles, by the way. We looked at that literature. Mm -hmm. nah. I had a psychometrician and a senior cognitive scientist working for me in addition to me, um, and we. But we were uh, the senior cognitive scientist had done work at Brooks Air Force Base on um, profiling learners. Now she was working with young Air Force recruits, which mm -hmm. weren't necessarily generalizable, but she'd come up with some really good cognitive capabilities, like how good are you at inductive reasoning, how good are you at deductive reasoning, and a number of other cognitive features that you can identify and use as a basis for adapting instruction. So. We were going that direction, and we actually got one up and running before 2001 happened, and the economy, you know, the internet economy blew up, and uh, again, long story. So I ended up, since then, you know, <laughs> consultant went from uh, a euphemism for unemployed to a way of life, mm -hmm. and that's been my life ever since. But it's that trajectory, starting with sort of computers and learning, and then looking at the broader picture, and one of the things that's happened is well, mobile was interesting, and I'm just designing a course on mobile now, so it's refreshed in my brain. Um, too often, organizations think of technology for delivering courses. And when they first think about mobile, they think about putting courses on a phone, which mobile learning or m-learning makes you think of. But really, that's almost the worst thing you could do. You can augment courses, but in general, I wouldn't put it on a phone. A tablet makes sense, but that's a different story. Mm -hmm. But taking mobile and its natural niche is performance support, you know, quick in the moment access. Boom, mobile's just perfect for that. The stuff Palm did where they found out the difference between a lap, the way you use laptop and the way you use mobile. Few sessions a day but very long versus many times a day but you just pull out. That's performance support. And then um, communication and staying in touch with people. That's what people use phones for nowadays more like this. And so Performance support is mobile's natural niche, but its real opportunity is contextual. Because it ha they have all those sensors and you move around and they can detect what's going on and where you are and a number of other features, we can start doing things because of when and where you are and more. Um, but that is makes mobile a gateway drug for learning and development to start thinking beyond the course as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, we have to do performance support stuff here. Well, maybe we should be doing that back in and social and and so, um, I guess that's a long answer to your question, but no. it brings in a lot of formative influences. Thank you for that. Uh, no, it's interesting to find out, uh, you know, how you got to where you are, and that's, that, that is the story. Let's shift gears here, and I'd like to know a little bit about how you came to your first exposure to what I'm calling HPT, Human Performance Technology, or however you might refer to that, but evidence-based practice for performance improvement. Well, I guess what I was searching for um, back when I was designing those games was evidence. I realized I wanted you know, science. I just was trained, you know, I went to UCSD, which was a, you know, sort of an engineering school, and I've just always been interested, you know, my magazines I subscribed to as a kid were popular science, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nerd. Um, and so I've always pursued that. And of course, doing my graduate work, um, Don was very much, he, he's still, you know, an excellent researcher as well as a theorist. And 
I was grounded in that. So I came to it from cognitive principles. Uh, interestingly, in my mind, a lot of HPT is largely behavioral influenced. And I was in a program, largely in a program of cognitive science, uh, at a time when it was going post cognitivist. So I was steeped in the cognitive models. But we began to realize so Ed Hutchins was doing the work that eventually led to his book Cognition in the Wild, which shows that our cognition is distributed. So it's not just what's in the head, but it's in the tools we use. It's distributed across tools and even other people. He looked at ship navigation and found out that you know, had people calling in coordinates it's when it's timed, and there's a guy with the map, and somebody else with the clock, and somebody else making decisions. It's very complex, um, and so it's distributed. And so that's, and they were talking about situated cognition in a number of different ways, and she, realizing that a lot of our thinking is emergent, so that situated cognition, as well as distributed, that we don't think formally, logically, and apply it the same way every time, depending on the context, we may be very different ways of acting. Uh, which is why you know, we need performance support. So we need tools like you know, checklists to keep us on. I love what Tokawanda is the checklist manifesto is fabulous articulation of, of when and how that works and why. Um, so, and again, that reading the performance support got me into that. And I actually taught, I wasn't steeped in instructional design, but I found out about it. David Merrill was doing a sabbatical near UCSD and he was kind enough to let me talk with him. I uh, subsequently met with him. I read Regalus first book, collecting all the different design theories, um, and uh, just have been fascinated looking at how different people think about learning. Yeah, I, now I'm quite broad. I'm looking at, you know, Collins, Brown, and Newman's, you know, cognitive apprenticeship, the same as I'm looking at Regalus. Uh, no, Merrill's go, for, you know, change from CDT to ID2 to now, you know, pebble in a pond. Um, so, I, I, you know, I've been around long enough to watch a number of these trajectories. Interestingly, my take, by the way, and I've looked at, you know, uh, Mager and, and uh, Gagne and, and other people. When I look at those trajectories, I see them in motion. They're not static, you know, again, Merrill's changed and other people are adapting and having to incorporate other things. And, you know, Rand Spiro's cognitive flexibility theory isn't something that I would expect that many people steeped in traditional instructions on see. But I think they're converging. I think they're going to end up, in my mind, cognitive apprenticeship is my favorite model, by the way. Mm -hmm. I love the whole um, reciprocal teaching of Brown and Palantzar and the scaffolding of Scardamale and Breiter and Schoenfeld's um, scaffolding as well, uh, beautiful stuff. Um, anyways, so, and then I heard about, you know, human performance technology and I looked into it and stuff and uh, my colleague Harold Yarkey had in the Internet Time Alliance had come from the military and knew about this stuff. In fact, he was certified for a while. And his reaction sort of reflects mine. I like the rigor. Um, I, sometimes I think it's overwhelming. So you're one of the people, a uh, guy who points to the Cognitive Technology Group at University of Southern California and uh, Richard Clark's work and finding out that 70% of what experts do is, not, is compiled away and inaccessible. Mm -hmm. Now they're, and I'm suddenly struggling to draw the process they use, cognitive task analysis, right. to get around that. That's absolutely brilliant. It's perfect. And it's almost completely unusable in the real world. It just isn't going to fit in corporate things. Now, it's absolutely essential where people's lives are at stake, mm -hmm. right? Airplanes, medicine, military. But in many everyday things, it's overwhelming. And you, it needs, you need a more accessible approach. One of my problems with ISBI is, no, we have to do it this way. I, I really want the uh, the... Idiot's Guide to Performance Consulting. Mm -hmm. I don't think it exists, you know. Um, it, and it's, it, it seems, you know, even if you wanted to get into it, and even if somebody helping, what you see is, is so voluminous, so rigorous, so complex, that it's off-putting. I'm afraid even your Lean ISD book, mm -hmm. which I think is about as lean as you can do that stuff, <laughs> is, is still um, really, really um, hard to, 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 to try and get your mind around. As, I, as, I appreciate <laughs> that. I've had to explain that how could a book on lean be so darn thick, and I, 
my retort is that it'll hold a door open in a windstorm. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so yeah, I appreciate that. The one other thing I would say is that you know, and I looked at the latest handbook that I could find from ISPI. Mm -hmm. This was several years ago now, and they had something about social, but it really didn't look like they go over to the informal side at all. They don't look at how do you facilitate the best brainstorming. How do you uh, facilitate uh, you know a community to pull out you know to get people to be able to answer questions in ways that anybody will answer it or to ask questions in a way that anybody will answer it. you know uh, there are lots of nuances to this that I think are really important these days and I mm -hmm. think they just don't address yeah. and I, I I I don't think it's you know deliberate omission I think it's just a blind spot but mm -hmm. um, it, it hasn't expanded to where I think organizations need to go. Um, mm -hmm. oh, and, that's fair. That's my opinion and it's worth every cent it costs you. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. No, I, no, I appreciate uh, uh, your take on that professional society. Of course, ISPI does not own the concepts of human performance technology. It just happens to be where I learned about them. Mm -hmm. But, um, no, I, I appreciate that. They don't um, own it, but they are sort of the, the castle or the, you know, the sort of the, the yeah they, they think like to think of themselves as the bastion of that right ranking. yeah and you know but at that you could find that at the old ASTD and I'm not sure about it ATD nowadays if you still if there's still the same uh, uh, push for that but mm -hmm. um, it may be because of its rigidity and complexity mm -hmm. and where people need something that's uh, leaner and quicker um, so I'm looking for your biggest influences now. You've you've mentioned quite a few already, but to help the audience here for this video think about who they might look to or what they might look to, are there people or articles or books that you would recommend um, for practitioners in this world of evidence-based practices for performance improvement? Um, Some of your favorites, the people that were influential to you and, um, you know, is, is more targeted so that people can go f find them. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I have to start probably with Don Norman. I okay. mean, so he was fundamentally shaping my thinking and I think it's so foundational. So he was in the process of writing the Design for Everyday Things book. He initially, my copy of it's actually called The Psychology of Everyday Things because that's what he first termed it and he liked the acronym POET, um, but he got feedback that that wasn't selling enough, and so he changed it, he agreed to change the design, his user, you know, iterative design, mm -hmm. and, um, and so I was steeped in that. And that book, everybody who reads it says, it just changes the way I look at the world. His, you know, so it's a bit more visceral in some sense than, mm -hmm. than you know, design. Uh, well, sort of learning design and performance support design, but just the way you design handles on doors and showers can simplify life or complexify it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, most of the audience here, I suspect, will have come to a door that they pushed when, the, and it turns out you were supposed to pull or vice versa. <laughs> so that is just such a, a fundamental book. I've liked other ones of this. Is if he followed that up with uh, things that make us smarter. Um, I think that recall the title of it. Uh, which is a little bit more abstract, but um, uh, I think very interesting and important as well. So his thinking has been foundational, not just for me, but for many people, and a lot of people recommend that. Um, I, again, I think Alan Collins and John Seeley Brown, uh, the work they did on, they wrote Cognitive Apprenticeship, two different versions of it, actually the one with Colin Brown's and Holum, I think is a little more accessible than the Colin Brown's and Newman work. And then they went on and wrote Situated Cognition, and they were thinking a lot about this more realistic way of, of learning. It's not like, you know, present information and do abstract problems. It was, hey, take turns, and everybody takes a turn providing feedback, tapping into social stuff that had come from, uh, um, the lady who did the work in Brazil, why am I having a blank on her name? Uh, it, it'll pop into my brain a bit later. But, um, okay. They did the sort of, she was a lady in Brazil who found out, you know, street kids 
would go into class and couldn't do math. And then they'd go out and they uh, were taking uh, bets and then paying off. They were serving as the intermediaries for the bookings. And mm -hmm. they were perfectly able to do the subtraction and figure out what was so They could do the math. They just couldn't do it abstract. Mm -hmm. And that's where we sort of learned. You know, and you know, this was uh, bolstered by uh, John Bramsford work in anchored cognition and found out that situated learning transfers far better. Um, he called it anchored cognition. But uh, the work they did with Jasper, and I don't know if there's any particular book. He ultimately, by the way, uh, is responsible, the chief editor, um, or the lead editor at least, on the, uh, I think, it, I don't know if it's the National Science Foundation, the Department of Education, it might be the National Science Foundation, but they compiled a, in the mid-2000s, he's passed away sadly, but they compiled a How People Learn, the synthesized the best research on how people learn. Mm -hmm. It's freely available, downloadable as a PDF, you have to pay if you want a paper copy, but it, because it, it's government funded and it's, it's, goes a bit deep, but if you really want to understand learning, that's where you should go. Um, I mentioned, you know, Harold Jarkey was partly a gateway drug. I met him through Jay Cross. Mm -hmm. And to me, Jay Cross was a seminal influence on my thinking, just as I was mentioning that social and informal stuff. He uh, was influenced by the guy who started the Institute for the Future in, uh, in Palo Alto. and. Became interested in, and I think his book *Informal Learning* is is a must read for people who are involved in organizational learning and performance, because it talks about how much of what we learn, and it you know, draws upon things like the 70-20-10 model, which, as I um, try and there, that's one of those controversial frameworks. People, some people, oh, the numbers aren't accurate, can't be anything right, and other people go. No, it's really useful in helping you think beyond the course, and these both are true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not about the numbers, it's framework, and that was just, they simplified it to, to communicate better. It, it, that's not the exact numbers they got, and it's been replicated with slightly different numbers, but I mean, the Department of, uh, U.S. Department of Labor is the one who said, you know, 20% of learning is former, 80% is informal. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, again, uh, I've met David Merrill, um, uh, and he's a great guy, and he did some really interesting thinking, and he went from more rigorous to more flexible and fluid through his trajectories of those um, design models. Um, I'm racking my brain, but uh, I met Alan Collins and John C. Lee Brown as well. Um, I, I'm drawing blank. You've you know, given, I, I, I think, think, our audience a lot to uh, pursue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, well, let me shift again here. If if you were to give us a thirty second elevator speech on what you currently do, um, you know, if you meet somebody at a party and they ask you what do you do, what what's your uh, uh, short uh, response to them? The very short answer is I help people work smarter. I stole that from Jay. The slightly longer version, I have two things. Mm -hmm. Largely, basically, what I do is is it falls in two things. I help organizations improve their learning design. Um, I don't, you know, tend to anymore work on specific products, you know, like a course on this. What I go is I look at their design process and say, here's the smallest changes you can make that will give you the biggest impacts. And, you know, these are the things on learning science that, you know, these are the points where you should collaborate. Here's how you should work with experts differently. Here's where, you know, you should put in some templates to make sure you're following, you know, and checklists to follow good design processes in your learning design. And the second thing is I help organizations um, look beyond the course. I help them strategize about what makes sense for them, whether they should go to performance support next or look at social next or start looking at integrating their underlying platforms. Um, it goes quite far. The l and I have a simple statement. Mm -hmm. L&D isn't doing near what it could and should, and what it is doing is doing badly, other than that is fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, it, too often that's true, and uh, there's so many technological advances that we're just not even taking advantage of. Like, you look at web marketing, they've got intelligent content pulled together up by rule instead of hardwired. You can, that would be the basis of personalization and adaptive learning. Uh, but it requires some rigor and content development and tagging and, and um, you know, 
and stop trying to have one platform do everything. You know, the mm -hmm. LMS, it does social, it does portals. Wonderful. Except you really want, I don't think it does portals very well, and social media doesn't do really well, and mm -hmm. you know, let's start getting best of breed, decouple it, let's integrate these together. Now, L&D can't do that, they got to work with INT. But L&D has to stop getting out of its silo. They have to start working with people. You know, here's one of the things I do with audiences, I go, how many of you think of IT as the enemy? Everybody raised their hand. I go, how many of you hate it when the network's down? Everybody raised their hand. I go, hello? <laughs> <laughs> right? It's, it's that. And if you understand that, that's their job to keep, you know, IT's job is to keep the network up and mm -hmm. running. And you want to do what? Um, but they have, should, a good IT department understands they have to continue to develop. So if you go in understanding their job, and then say, how can we work together to meet this new capability that's really important for the organization? You can make this work. Mm -hmm. The same thing goes, you know, as you would advocate, you can't just get out and talk to your business partners. What is the data that says that they're not doing well, and how will we know if it's moved? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what is the baseline? So, Thank you. Uh, so that's an overview of the kind of consulting services that you provide. Is there anything else besides what you just mentioned that uh, we should... Uh, let our audience know? I speak. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, try and present uh, compelling ex expositions of this stuff. So, you know, games, mobile, um, you know, deeper learning design, and... Uh, and the, so you said earlier that you don't course. do a lot of this work yourself anymore. You consult on it, but do you have a team of people that you could bring in should your clients want to... Uh, uh, you know, more of a turnkey kind of a approach to. I absolutely do. I haven't done that. I tend to get brought in by other uh, people. So I have partners who've brought me in on uh, larger consulting engagements. I have people I can draw upon. I just haven't been. Uh, I guess that entrepreneur. My brother got all the entrepreneur genes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, Cliff. <laughs> um, what? Could you tell us about your f current focus for learning? You, you, what are you specifically focused on? And then I want to ask a little bit more about some of the things that you're writing because you write and uh, publish in many different places. And so, but but what, as a lifelong learner, do you have a focus or a foci that you can share with us? Um, yeah, keep learning. Um, stay curious, my friends. Um, is uh, I don't have the accent to do that right. <laughs> stay curious, my friends. Um, but I do want to, you know, one of the things that hasn't really emerged in this is sort of the emotional side okay. and what I've discussed so far, and that's really important to me. I think we do everything on the cognitive side, and we don't really, you know, Keller is the only person who's really talked about this scientifically, Zark's model. Um, increasingly, people are trying to think about engagement. And I've talked about, you know, I think you've got to hook people in emotionally before, you know, we know we have to open, you know, activate relevant knowledge, but I think even before that you need to open them up. I want a wry recognition that they need, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, I do need this. And I began exploring just recently transformative uh, learning, and I looked into, you know, academics have looked at this. Uh, Mezikow, I think, is a person who's looked at transformative learning, but this is triggered by deep experiences. This is triggered by, uh, you know, deaths or, <laughs> you know, and in the family or something, and, and I don't really want to do that as part of my learning mm -hmm. experience design. Yeah. Um, you know, and I do like the term learning experience design because to me it, it is about melding the emotional, and you know, we have science around the emotions as well, mm -hmm. so it's integrating that with the learning science to make it work. But the uh, Pew and um, his colleague Hetty have talked about transformative experiences, let's scale that down and say to do it. And what they've done it for is school learning and sort of had a teacher talk about how they learned this principle and they've seen it in the world and now would you go see it in the world, which is really cool, mm -hmm. but not going to work for the workplace. So I've been thinking about how do we take that? And to me it's, it's again hooked into that first opening experience, but instead of just you know, I've, I've used cartoons to get that right recognition. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. okay, I get it. Yeah. Um, but can we make it more uh, substantive? Do we? Can we really try and make even the most mundane thing 
a recognition that I need to look at the world in a new way to really take advantage of this and how do I precipitate that and then mm -hmm. how do I and so uh, I'm doing a learning experience design workshop learning solutions in a couple weeks and I've snuck it in there it wasn't in the original description but so I'm gonna give it a try and, mm -hmm. and see how that floats but um, that's one of the places where I'm um, uh, I like playing I guess <coughs> Excuse me. You're you do a lot of writing, and um, can you talk to us a little bit about for our audience um, where they should be looking for you online so that they can keep abreast of uh, what, what you're publishing? Mm -hmm. um, most of the thoughts that end up in books and presentations and articles tend to show up in my blog. So learnlets.com is. I got that URL, and uh, mm -hmm. so I, I decided to use it for the blog. That's where my thoughts tend to be. Um, from there, you get links to Quinnovation site, and then you can get links. I have sites for all my books, but um, uh, there are two other places online I do write. Uh, I write a Quins, the Quinn Sites column mm -hmm. for the Learning Solutions Magazine of the Ear Learning Guild, and uh, I write a regularly for the Litmus blog as well. So those are places where online you can find my writing. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the, your books here. Your, I think, most recent book was The Millennials, Goldfish, and Other Training Misconceptions. Can you give us a quick uh, snapshot overview of, of what you present in that book? Sure. Uh, the, one of the pervasive problems in our industry, and, and Guy, you've been calling it out, uh, as have a number of people, and finally ATD came to me and said, would you write a book? And I thought, am I the best person? I have actually pinged Will and asked if he wanted to do it with me, and he finally decided it wasn't a good business decision, which may be right. Um, <laughs> um, but there are a number of myths that permeate our industry. Things that are provably wrong, and yet people sell, mm -hmm. and uh, spend money investing into their designs, and it's wasted. It may not even be just a waste of money. It may actually be harmful to the learning. And so I've been looking at these as, as you know, because I have that research background as, so, as well as other people and I encountered them. So they asked, so what I did was I collected, it ends up there's 16 myths, five superstitions. There were probably a lot more, but I got five out of my network and 16 misconceptions. And the myths are things that are wrong, provably wrong. We can go back and either find out where they got wrong or, you know, show that the research shows that they're not valid. Um, superstitions or behaviors, I don't think people even necessarily consciously have thought about, but they still are in their practices and, and they're not necessarily provably wrong, they're just clearly wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and then the misconceptions are things that people argue about. Some people love, some people hate. And what I try to do is find out um, where it makes sense. In other words, here's that side, here's that side, here's where and how you, when you should use it okay. and how. By the way, for the myths, I try and give for everyone's what you should do instead. Yes, that's, I like that about the book, helping people, they're trying to accomplish something and they think that this myth might do it for them, but uh, what they need is more guidance on what to do instead. So that okay. is a great part of the book. So we tried to be just concise and just, you know, here's the myth, mm -hmm. here's what, why people it's why it's attractive, why, you know, what the data research, how you study it, what the research said, what you should do instead. And so I just repeated that. So it's not something you just tend to sit down and read cover to cover. You pick it up and um, either de index it when you have a specific question or just graze. But mm -hmm. uh, hopefully it helps. Well, I have a list of uh, several other books here. So can you give us a snapshot of uh, Revolutionized Learning and Development? What was that all about? Well, that's the one where I'm saying they're not doing near what they could and should. So that's about um, rethinking. I would argue that most learning and development is still stuck, in a sense, in the industrial age model. It's about, you know, we train people up and then we set them go and then make sure they're good little cogs in the machine. And that's not the world we live in anymore. The information age, a lot of what you, you know, plan and prepare and execute is outdated by the time you ever get to the execute point. <laughs> When we need to be more agile, more flexible. There is, you know, I'm not one of those people who says there's no role for courses. I think most people don't actually say there's no role for mm -hmm. courses. They just say we overuse it. And 
done right, it's harder to do than what most people do. You know, you can't just throw bullet points and a quiz up on the screen to get mm -hmm. learning that's really going to persist. So you need to save that for when you really need, you know, positively, absolutely has to be in the head. Um, and instead, you know, you're the one, I learned the quote from Joe Harless about, you know, mm -hmm. inside every uh, fat course is a thin job aid struggling to get out. Mm -hmm. You know, so performance sport, but then also going beyond that, that's the, I suggest that what organizations need is optimal execution, but that's only the cost of entry, and the only sustainable differentiator is going to be continual innovation, and that's where you go into the informal learning. And think about it. When you do research, when you do problem solving, when you do design, you don't know the answer when you start. So that's learning too. And I think there's nobody better placed in the organization or should be than L&D if we really understand learning, mm -hmm. which we don't enough. You know, I think there needs to be a lot of learning science 101 going around. Yeah. <laughs> but then we can go into supporting informal learning and that stuff I was talking about that I think is missing from SB is that. So it's showing how L&D is failing and then showing what the opportunities are. Because I really think there's a vibrant opportunity to put L&D at the very core of organizational success. As core as IT, because we're about facilitating all the stuff that's going to lead to um, innovation. So that's what it is, is telling that story and showing what all the components are and then supporting people self-assessing and developing a plan to go forward. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the next book here on my list, I don't have these in the order that they came mm -hmm. out, but uh, Engaging Learning, Designing E-Learning Simulation Games. Right. That was my very first book, and um, it almost exploded out of my fingers when I finally got it, because I'd been doing games for so long. So that first job out of college, and then game on my PhD thesis, and a game to help the kids, and then um, as consulting, I, some of my work was on games, and it, I'd written a journal article based upon that games for the kids that my thinking had coalesced, and I first wrote a little IT forum, I don't know if you remember IT forum, it's an online learning uh, no, I don't, discussion but... board that mm -hmm. has existed for decades, it's kind of more of a now, um, but I wrote a post for them, and that just got expanded into the uh, book, and um, it's about, in theory it's about how do you design games for learning, but in some sense, it's really about that marriage of the emotional experience and mm -hmm. the effective education. And it turns out, at the core of it, is this notion that the elements of effective education practice and the elements of an engaging experience align. And if you un you can't just put game designers and structural designers in a room together, because then you get chocolate covered broccoli, or um, you know, mm -hmm. or uh, oatmeal candy or something. Uh, but if you understand that line you really can make experiences that are engaging and more effective. And so that's the underlying principle and that permeates a lot of my thinking about good design. And then your book on designing M learning, tapping into the mobile revolution for organizational performance. Right. So there, there hadn't been any real books on mobile. Uh, David Metcalf wrote one. And it had a lot of good ideas in it, but it was poorly edited, and it just didn't do the, the job for him. And so um, I was asked to write it, uh, and um, I checked with him and Judy Brown. They both said, no, I don't want to write it. And they were sort of the two leading people at the time, so I wrote it. And mm -hmm. um, I really tried to write it in a way, and this is true that the game book as well, I try and separate it from the current technology, so I talk about technology a bit. But then I go in and I talk about principles. It's always rooted back in our brains because that's the thing that's you know sort of unchanging. Evolution is pretty bloody slow. That notion of the attention span of the goldfish, we've mm -hmm. degraded to that. Evolution doesn't happen that fast, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. So I've tried to ground it in how our brains work, but I talked about um, you know, augmenting learning. I really wanted to call it augmenting learning, but Alison Ross had told me not to, and uh, she was probably right. Mm -hmm. But so but also performance support and contextual learning and it so it was trying to lay out thinking mobile and mm -hmm. get your mind around thinking mobile and then you know talk about some design and development principles but it was really about the initial thinking and then applying that to a variety of opportunities and how does that then differ from the mobile academy m learning for higher education other than it's targeted higher education 
All right. So after you know, I wrote this one for the organization. Josie Bass was a different um, uh, arm of Wiley than than Pfeiffer, and they said, "Could you write one for higher education? Mm -hmm. It should be easy. You know, you just fix, change a few things. Do it in a month, right? Mm -hmm. Sure." <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and I actually got a draft done for them in a month, and I said, "Please don't publish this, because uh, I like to meet my commitments." And um, they agreed, and uh, so he gave me a more realistic. Uh, deadline and I essentially wrote a whole new book. It, it's again, they're both surprisingly lean. Um, I have this problem of, of writing very tersely, which my uh, English AP English teacher said would be my doom, mm -hmm. and actually was good for AP because you need to write concisely mm -hmm. on the test. But also, just um, my books, my publisher sometimes go, it's too thin. Yeah, but the, it's it's. Everything you need to be, but it's specifically focused on higher ed. I think it also uh, applies to anything above K six. So okay. I think it would apply to middle school and higher ed uh, and high school as well. But it was specifically written for higher ed per their request. Okay. And the last book I have on the list, not that it is the, the the complete list of all your books, but engaging learning, designing e learning simulation games. Didn't we already? Oh, I did already that one. Oh, yeah. Here we're done. And, and with that you. is the complete list. Those five ah, books okay. are the. Thank you. Five so far. <laughs> All right. Well, let me shift gears after uh, that faux pas. Um, is there a favorite performance improvement or learning term or phrase that you would like to define for us? And when I ask people this question, it's because they are perhaps annoyed of the misuse of a particular term or phrase, or they have a. A uh, term or phrase that they would like to promote and define for the for the world here. What what do you have for us? Okay, um, you know I could go transformational learning, but we discussed that, mm -hmm. um, and I, I sort of talked about the emotional side of it. So I I guess I'm going to jump in on informal learning, and uh, people have done silly things like talked about non formal learning. Like, come on, what do you mean by that? In and they so. People have taken also informal learning to be just stuff we can't do anything about. And I think that's not where we're going. Uh, and Jay Cross pulled together four of us as uh, the Internet Time Alliance to join. It, it, the, the, the story behind that is I find funny. So he had written informal learning of largely about social learning, and then he was going around by himself talking about it, and he said, wait, I'm contradicting my own principles. So he brought in... Um, Jane Hart, who is a good friend of his, and then he brought in Harold Jarkey, um, who we really admired, and he brought in uh, Charles Jennings, and he was kind enough to include me. We stuck together. And it goes, so what Harold has is his personal knowledge mastery, um, which is about how do you become a good, effective learner. And we don't, you know, nobody teaches this stuff. And so he talks about uh, his seek, sense, share model, I really like, you know, so what are your inputs? when you seek and what, how do you set a filter so that there's also a stream coming in and then how do you make sense of it? You know, do you um, re-represent it to yourself? Do you try experimenting it and learning from it? And then sharing that, and that's a very important part of this cycle. And one underlying principles for informal learning are, you know, uh, what uh, Amy Edmondson and Garvin and uh, Gino talked about as learning culture dimensions. So it's got to be openness to new ideas and not just a tolerance for diversity, but actually valuing it and time for reflection. But another part is continual experimentation, but also psychological safety. And Amy Edmondson's got a new book out about that. That's it's safe to share. I talk about the Miranda organization, where anything you say can and will be held against you. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be effective for learning and sharing. So he's got personal knowledge mastery, and then. You know, we like the idea of work out loud, except now the guy has trademarked that too much. So now I like Jane Bozar's show your work. Mm -hmm. But it's it's learning out loud, and you need to not just show your work, but show the the thinking behind it is really important. And when you start sharing that, other people can learn from it if you're sort of at the leading edge, or they can be tracking, or they can improve it if you know you're sort of a newbie. And this becomes mentoring and coaching, which are a big part of this. And then it's, and Harold set me straight on this, you know, communication and collaboration. And actually communication is more important than collaboration. Collaboration, we're putting it together and solving it, and we know how to facilitate. There are good and bad ways to brainstorm, I've talked about that. But 
um, communication, means cooperation, means when you put something out, you ask a question, if I know the answer, I will answer it, versus mm -hmm. hoarding knowledge. And similarly, I'm willing to ask questions and get feedback and share my learning. So it's that cycle. And, you know, Jane talks about modern workplace learning, Jane Hart, and uh, not Jane Bozarth, Jane Hart, mm -hmm. one of the ITA. And she has a whole set of just very sensible practices that organizations can do. And Charles has been a great proponent of 70-20-10, again, that notion that you can't just do the course event and think you're done, but you need to, and you know, the people who argue against, go, oh, well, good design is always that. Yeah, well, how can we see so much bad design? And this is, he's used as a tool to open up executives to the idea that then they can go back and LD can, you know, take, will now get resources to do that stuff as well. And that's where it's been effective. The 20% comes from coaching and mentoring and interaction, and 70% is getting assignments that challenge you at just the right level so that you can and got reflection on it so that we uh, can develop people. And it's not saying allocate your money that way. It's, so there's a big bucket under informal learning that unpacks, but it's to me an important concept to recognize that that's where that's essentially innovation. You could have called it innovating. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's, and I talk about fast and slow innovation. So there's the fast innovation where we have a problem, let's put together a, a diverse and competent team to you know, bring from different communities practice, work on it, solve it, and feed back the learnings back to their communities practice. And the communities practice and the learning, there's a nice coherent org diagram we use. But then there's the slow innovation, and this is what uh, Keith Sawyer talks about as well in Group Genius and Stephen Berlin Johnson and where good ideas come from. Creating an environment where you're exposed, as Stephen Berlin Johnson talks about, to the adjacent possible to ideas that are um, connected and you need to track related fields like, you know, for, in, for learning design and performance, you, you should be looking at software engineering and graphic design and uh, information design and um, uh, some of the underlying systems uh, integration and content systems, a variety of other related fields we should be tracking. And so the adjacent possible and allowing that continual friction, you know, Jay and Informal Learning talked about redesigning your office. Put the mail room and the coffee room in the same place where people then will be forced to interact um, and this open plan, research just shown, you know, it's, it shuts down communication. I was listening to NPR on this. And instead, we need to create places where people can congregate and do useful work, and then time, places where they can be alone, because that's that part of brainstorming. You need to do your individual thoughts and then bring them in. Instead of bringing them in and immediately get everybody to talk, it's the first person to talk constraints of thinking of everybody else. So, sorry, it unpacks a lot, but I think it's really important for people like your audience to mm -hmm. get their minds around this. Thank you. Um, I'd like to shift now again to um, asking for stories about people in the past, something that you can help share with us so that uh, um, we can get to know some of the folks, whomever you might mention here, we didn't discuss this in advance, but uh, uh, bring them alive, uh, show us their personalities, uh, so whether they're humorous stories or uh, stories that come out of projects or conference attendances or whatever. <laughs> but who, who, who can you tell us, uh, share with us some of the stories? Um, well, I'll start with Don again, um, okay. because he was influenced me at, when I was an academic, when I was working with my students, his models you know, percolated uh, down to me. And I had to learn this the hard way. So I would bring an idea for, you know, after you do your, your first year, then you start trying to come up with a PhD thesis topic. And I would bring something to him and he'd shoot a holes in it. So I'd take it away and come up with something else, thinking he hated it. And he'd shoot holes in it and take it away. And finally, I re you know, A, I got frustrated and said, you know, R -r -r. but also I think I finally realized, at least internally, that he was shooting holes in it for me to fix it. If I really wanted to do it, I should indeed fix it and bring it back. So mm -hmm. I picked a topic and he shot holes in it and I fixed it and brought it back. And finally I got out. But 
that was his approach. And we had these weekly seminars where everyone would come in and we'd take turns sharing. And at first it was scary, but then I realized everybody was good naturedly, you know, poking holes, but it wasn't, there are vicious places. Yeah. And I think Don had actually been at Harvard where it was one and where, you know, he made scored points by pointing out flaws, you know, mm -hmm. and he didn't want that. So it was a collegial environment. And uh, I, and in subsequent, in my research into what makes group work and informal learning and cultures work, he had it right. And that's mm -hmm. what was really nice. So, you know, I just wish he'd been a bit more <laughs> explicit up front about, you know, bring me a topic, I'll shoot holes in it instead of, uh, um, he's, he has a, it's, it's funny, he, he comes across as a little curmudgeon, and yet he actually has a very warm heart. He's a good guy, but don't tell him, but I'm sure he wouldn't <laughs> want that to be known. Um, and I've already told tales of Jay, you know, Jay was such an interesting guy because he was he would state something. And if you pointed out he was wrong, boom, he was done. There was no defensiveness, no. He was just the most open learner I ever saw. Mm -hmm. He would just, oh, okay, that's really interesting, thanks. I had it wrong. And um, he was just so gregarious. I, 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 I've channeled my inner Jay in some of my business dealings, but I can never just be ha as gregarious as he was. He'd just go up and talk to anybody. You know, the keynote speaker, you know, some $10,000 come and Jay had been in. $10,000 keynote speaker, so maybe a twenty or $30,000 mm -hmm. keynote speaker. The head, um, he got a picture with the, the guy who had been the head of GE, um, famous thinker, I'm going to forget his name. But Jay just went up and said, hey, you know, they were, you know, he'd spoken and come down and so people okay. could meet with him but, and get their pictures taken with him. Jay said, take the picture like we're the best buds ever. And he got this fabulous <laughs> picture out of it. Um, he just had such a way of, uh, with people about him and just so open and, and uh, garrulous. And, you know, he was a contrarian and he didn't, he would, if, if he thought people were full of it, he would let them know. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he wouldn't change his mind if he was right and uh, wouldn't be cowed. And uh, that was, uh, yeah, that got him, uh, you know, set some people offside, but most people recognized that that was a really valuable mm -hmm. um, stance to have. So, um, so you mentioned Allison Reset a little while ago. Did, can you share with us any personal stories uh, about Allison? Um, she's just such a straightforward person. She's so sensible. Well, um, she's got that. A sarcastic East Coast sort of humor. Mm -hmm. um, so she uh, can poke fun at things. She's a bit more, you know, uh, I would say she's more diplomatic than Jay was. Um, she didn't want to uh, uh, put people off too much, but she was willing to call things out, but she would do it in a more uh, sarcastic and funny way many times. Uh, I, I, I am a great admirer of that sort of humor. I think more mine tends to be more goofy humor, um, West Coast or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, but she's a really nice person, and you know she's been very generous to me uh, in a number of ways. And, you know, was willing to. Uh, I think she wrote. She and Mark uh, Rosenberg both wrote little thing blurbs in my uh, uh, revolutionized book because mm -hmm. they've been sort of early advocates of going beyond the course. Mark's um, Beyond E-Learning was really a, a similar landmark in, in mm -hmm. but just thinking courses. And so he had a more rigorous, you know, he came from big five consulting type of stuff, and so he had a big consulting approach, and Jay's was much more flexible, but, um, and went in different directions, but they both were sort of landmarks in that way. But yeah, Allison is just, she's sharp, she's, no, she is, you know, knows business, knows how to uh, talk well to business, does good consulting, she does great talks, and she's just a good person. Mm -hmm. Who else? Anybody else? You know, um, I am, uh, nothing comes to mind. Oh. It will, you know, <laughs> shortly thereafter. Sure, that's how it always works. Well, Clark, thank you so much for agreeing to participate with me in this video interview. Um, particularly for our audience, people kind of new to the field, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for them that you can share? Um, go back to stay curious, uh, my friends. Learning it has to happen. I think if you stop learning, you're you're basically dead. Uh, which is kind of you know a harsh way to put it, but it really is that way. Um, 
there are so many things to explore and it's easy to get locked in and sometimes you have to fight for that time for reflection. And yet we know that to put arbitrary numbers on it, if you work an eight hour day, if you actually work seven hours and reflect for an hour every day, you're more effective than if, you, you, you'll actually be better than if you reflect all eight hours. Now that doesn't go all the way down to one hour of work and seven hours of reflection, but if you put a, some 10% of your time in reflection, you're more effective and you improve and uh, learn from others, learn with and from others. The more you can be open and share your learnings, um, the faster you learn because you're forced to. I have a diagram, but as you get concrete about putting your ideas down, it you realize you didn't understand it as well as you thought you did and you have to flesh it out so you do more processing so you learn better and then if people give you feedback on it, it can improve your understandings as well and that is just um, be generous. I, I have benefited so much from uh, so many people. I had great uh, managers who just shared with me. Um, I should, you know, two folks, uh, Joe Miller, unfortunately, he passed away tragically early, but was an incredibly smart guy in so many fields. Um, and Jim Schuyler was the guy who hired me uh, out of college to design games and subsequently hired me back to uh, develop the adaptive learning platform. And he's just been an incredible mentor. He's, uh, I've got a tenure, he can does mute, now he's uh, organizing concerts, he did a music program, but he's just been a model of intellectual rigor and a totally nice guy. He's very quiet, unassuming. You wouldn't hear of him typically. He doesn't give many talks, but really sharp guy. Anyways, um, so be generous, keep learning, have fun. Absolutely, you know, find the fun in it. Find the fun in learning and, and let that drive you. Thank you for that. And thank you again for doing this video with me. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity and thanks for, uh, for the support to the community. Thank you.